This is 2ZY calling. This is 2ZY calling from the past memories of the early days of broadcasting. 2ZY calling. I was actually resting from the theatrical world uh, in Manchester when I met an old friend of mine in a very famous drinking house in Manchester who was going out to Metropolitan because of Trafford Park to what he said was one of the most marvellous things in the world. And he took me out there uh, to see uh, um, this radio business at work, this wireless thing, as he called it. Uh, that is how I went out there in November. I think I'm right in saying November the 28th, 1922. That is the voice of Victor Smythe, one of the early stalwarts who came to pioneer radio drama in the North. The wireless thing he went to hear at Trafford Park probably sounded like this. Now that's a recent recording made from an early crystal set. Providing you start with a transmission of good quality, reception by crystal is excellent. Of course, the crystal set at Trafford Park that night was receiving much poorer quality transmission. Broadcasting was just beginning. What would come of it, no one knew, but many had high hopes. On the tide of these hopes, broadcasting sailed to its present standards. Tonight, we are not attempting a factual history or documentary. We are trying to capture some of that early enthusiasm and versatility in the hope that we'll pass on to you some of that fun they all had in the days of the cat's whisker. But first we ought to have some facts. Let's get them from a man who started at the beginning and is still serving in Manchester control room, Jim Grundy. Well, uh, probably this is very, very old history, but the uh, business really started at Metropolitan Vickers as an offshoot in the research department of Metropolitan Vickers until August the 1st, 1923, when the BBC, the British Broadcasting Company, obtained premises and occupied premises with its own transmitter in Dickinson Street in the city. Uh, we were there until uh, December 1924 when we moved to palatial premises uh, level with the bed of the Irwell in 1924, December. And then super, super accommodation uh, in 1928 Piccadilly. The relay stations started to appear more or less one by one uh, 1924 and they persisted until the regional scheme which uh, one a year was open starting with London then Midland then the north then Scotland then down to the west country uh, and they opened these and they started those I think in 1928 I think it was uh, that briefly is the setup you see a few more facts, this time about the British Broadcasting Company itself. Basil Vernon's the speaker. He started at Metropolitan Vickers and became regional engineer in the north till his retirement just a few years ago. The basis of the formation of the company was that it would provide a market for radio transmitters and receivers, more particularly for receivers. And any um, firm who were capable and competent to manufacture receivers, which had to be approved by the government and have a stamp to show that they were approved for broadcasting, uh, could, be, uh, could become a member of this company by buying a one pound share. But the company was mainly financed by six big firms of whom Metropolitan Vickers were one, General Electric Company another, Marconi was another, and so on. They put up, I think it was £10,000 each. And then any number of small firms all over the country paid their one pound to become uh, a shareholder and member of the firm. And that gave them the privilege and the right to make receivers and sell them to the public with a stamp on them to show that they were approved in type, uh, mainly crystal sets in those days, of course. Well, next, let's take a quick look round those relay stations Jim Grundy mentioned. Liverpool first, 6LV. John Dunkley, now controller of Midland Region, started there. 
one of the things I, that I remember appealed so much to me in Liverpool was that one was uh, operating in a particular locality. You know, it was a station for Merseyside. Yes. And latterly, there's been a lot of talk about local broadcasting. Well, we were doing it, you know, when there were many more wavelengths then than the, there are now, and able to try our hand at uh, all sides uh, of, of radio, including such ambitious things as the first performance on the air of, of Ibsen's Pier Ghent. And Muriel Levy, Auntie Muriel, started as organiser children's programmes in Liverpool in her teens. She has hilarious memories. In the days when everything was done in the one studio, I must explain that the studio was situated over a cafe and the staircase ran up from the ground floor, first to the cafe and then to the studio. We had a, a producer who helped do, to, to do the effects as well and a, a shot had to be fired in the middle of a play and he, we felt it was too loud in the studio and uh, this shot was fired outside the studio and a poor old man was coming up the stairs for a cup of tea and thought he was being murdered and he promptly collapsed and had to be carried into the studio and was uh, got all mixed up with the play it all had to be hushed up and now across the pennines to hear philip fox first station director at leeds 2ls the Leeds Bradford Relay Station opened at the Leeds Town Hall on the evening of July the 8th, 1924. It was the first time, and I believe the only time, that the Lord Mayors of Leeds and Bradford appeared on the same platform. Mr J. C. W. Reith, as he then was, appointed me to open and run the station on June the 4th, 1924, just one month to get things going. My first local broadcast in the studio on the following day was Children's Hour a programme which ran from 5 to 6 p.m., six days a week, for several years to come. A programme which, before it ended, raised £500 for charity out of the sale of children's radio circle badges and postcards of the aunts and uncles. With great speed, programme ideas developed, and soon they had broadcast from the seaside. <laughs> A life on the ocean wave, a home on the rolling deep, where the scattered waters rave and the winds their revels keep. Like an eagle caged, I pine on this dull, unchanging shore. Oh, give me the flashing brine, the spray and the tempest roar. And one broadcast did end in the drink. In the summer months, we took the microphone to the seaside, Scarborough and Bridlington, mostly for dance music. Though on one occasion, I arranged for Sidney Furman to broadcast a suitable Sunday afternoon programme of light classics and opera and gentle tunes with nostalgic appeal. I, I couldn't be there to see the programme go out, and when later my friend, the engineer in charge, telephoned from Scarborough to tell me that what you do Sunday, Mary, a questionable and popular tune of the day had been included in my Sunday program. And as the press also rang me up, I became very uneasy. I hurried over to Scarborough to be confronted with placards at street corners blazing the headlines. BBC fiasco, Mr Fox explains. Mr Fox did explain. Ah, oh, there were great explainers in them days. Oh, yes. Albert Alfred helped to build the present Leeds studios. He then joined them, and he's still there. He strove with success to emulate his much-revered and loved boss and friend, Philip Fox. And it wasn't long before he, too, could boast a fiasco. I once remember nearly getting the, the sack. I had to uh, turn up and meet the uh, Northern Studio Orchestra, the Symphony Orchestra, mm. as it was in those days. And I really showed up on the Sunday afternoon at the Leeds station with a taxi. I met Mr. Riley, he says, oh, just the man I want to see. He was a librarian in those days. Just the man I want to see, he says, come and have a cup of tea before we start. I knew I'd done something wrong, as somebody said before we start. He says, uh, you've brought your wagon, have you? I says, wagon, Mr. Riley? I said, no, I brought a taxi. A taxi? Well, he says, uh, have you, you, I don't suppose you've seen the gear. Well, 
we went and had a look, and on the back of the train they did a special wagon to put all the instruments in. And when I saw this special wagon with all the instruments in, I just about died. Well, I piled as many as ever I could, both on top of the taxi and in the taxi, but the harp and the bass had just got me beat. There was four basses and the harp box. Little realising they were going to travel in the boxes, but travelling in the cases, we could have got them in the taxi. So what I did with the bass cases, I piled them onto a station trolley and the harp, and I lugged them from the city station to Woodhouse Lane by myself. I was three quarters of an hour late for rehearsal. <laughs> and there was also a relay station at Hull, 6KH. Audrey Nicholson remembers it. And um, who was the kingpin there then, Audrey? I think it would, uh, you'd, you'd say it was Tom Whitty, a young solicitor, and he was also a scoutmaster, and he took over the children's hour. Well, didn't take it over, he created it, really. And uh, he, he made really, uh, I think, quite an impression. He got a lot of talented amateurs, let's call them that, <laughs> round him. And we, he had he played the piano brilliantly. Of course, that was a tremendous help. That really was the beginning. Mm. And then he wrote little scripts. We had nursery rhymes and all that sort of thing. And then at about quarter to six, I think he a quarter to five rather, he thought he'd get a bit um, yeah. serious. That's the word I want. Thank you so much. Uh, and he put on talks for his scouts. How serious can you get? Now, Newcastle 5NO was different. I think it could only happen to the Geordies. It was different up there and complicated. Oh, brother! Tom Payne was the first station director there. He's 80-plus today, but the memory lingers on. Uh, we had a different concert every night. And uh, they used to, people were already ringing up saying, why don't you get a change, Mr. Payne? I said, what do you want, Lockhart's elephants or something like that, you know? And Mr. Thomas wouldn't stand for more than an hour broadcasting in the evening at first. He said, I said, but we'll have to have more, Mr. Thomas. He said, no, I can't get my transmitter. It'll have to be got ready. And he wouldn't do more than an hour. I wasn't allowed to order him. I was BBC. He was Marconi. Marconi built that transmitter to the order of the British Broadcasting Company who were not yet formed. And uh, therefore, I claim it is the first, it was the first BBC transmitter, and no one can dispute that. And when Mr. Reith came up about three weeks after for this interview, he said to me, Mr. Payne, when we're going to the station, he says, what are you doing for money? I said, well, I'm paying out of the Payne and Hornsby banking account, my own. And uh, I claim that I'm the only individual that ever kept a broadcasting station running out of his own pocket. And that is the truth. I did the announcing from the very first. And if John Snag had been up there, he wouldn't have got a word in edgeways. And Manchester? Well, in modesty, we've reserved Manchester for the last. Kenneth Wright was 2ZY's first director. He was in from the word go. In those days, we didn't know there was going to be a unified BBC, and we in the north felt ourselves in competition with Marconi in the south, and uh, we were hoping, of course, we could put a kink in our wave or something to give us a, an advantage. But uh, in fact, we developed at the same time as Captain Peter Eckersley was developing in Rittle, in London, near London, you know and we reached the same point together and were suddenly told that the BBC company, that is, had been formed and we should start the public service on the uh, 14th of November 1922, which unfortunately we couldn't do because we only got the news late in the afternoon. The only way of getting the news bulletins in those days was to have them telephoned up from London, taken down in shorthand typed and then read by myself or somebody so that we had to delay our opening by one day, and that's why we are the 15th as against 14th for 2LO. Some people still think London did it deliberately. Hugh Bell was also a research engineer at Metropolitan Vickers in the year 1922, and he was responsible for technical design and operation of 2ZY. As engineer in charge, his memory of that first day is very clear. Tom Heaney asked him about it. 
Mr. Bell, what was it like the first night of 2ZY, November 15, 1922? What was the atmosphere like as the uh, deadline approached? Well, as far as we were concerned, it, it was exciting, to say, the, to say the least of it. You see, we had equipment there. Nobody knew an awful lot about it. We'd been trying exper experiment broadcasts for some days before, and we had fairly good reports, some from local people, some from quite a distance. And if we got something good, then everybody said, Ooh, hold it. Don't, don't alter anything. And uh, very likely uh, the next night was a washout. Anyway, that night, uh, it had worked the day before. We had our fingers crossed. And when the deadline came, well, we breathed a, a, a prayer, I think, and, and put the switch in. And it worked. Everybody thought we were wizards. <laughs> I think we thought we were wizards too. <laughs> Now, you remember John Dunkley mentioned Pier Gint at Liverpool? Well, Doris Gamble was in it. And this was no hole-in-the-corner affair, was it, Doris? No, no. Uh, we did one full-scale performance. Cast, orchestra, choir, um, an organ upstairs in the waiting room with another portion of choir. I was singing the songs for Solveig, of course. When I wasn't singing the songs, I ran up the stairs and played the organ in the waiting room for the choir upstairs. But the, um, the most exciting part was during the performance because the studio was so full of people, there was literally no room for me to stand. So I sat on the floor underneath the grand piano and when it was time for me to sing, one of the members of the speaking cast took my place under the piano and I stood in front of the microphone and sang. <laughs> The incredible thing is, you know, that they seem to have been doing the same sort of things we do today. In fact, I don't think we are as clever as we thought we were. Listen to Kenneth Wright again. He was passionately keen on music. And what appealed to me very much was, here is a chance of putting wonderful music and all the other things into people's homes. And I was particularly interested in children and giving them good music instead of bad music and so on. So we was, I, I think we were the first people to start children's programs uh, from the very beginning, the 15th of November. In 1923, we started giving weekly talks uh, in uh, French, teaching French and then Spanish and German and eventually Italian as well. These things went on week after week. We also had reviews of books. We had weekly talks about gardening uh, and the kind of things that uh, other people adopted, if I may say so, after us. One of the things that uh, we created from the very beginning was a thing called Mr. X's Corner, which followed the news every evening. And it was a thing which developed ultimately into what we now call current events. And what of the news then? What of that? Tom Heaney was especially interested, and he questioned Reginald Jordan, who started broadcasting as a lad of about 11. A pioneer in short pants, as Tom put it. What about the news in those days? Well, right from the word go, uh, the news was presented with complete impartiality and integrity. It was received, if I recall correctly, from Reuter and Press Association sources, on a private telephone and uh, more or less whoever happened to be nearest to the instrument at the time the news was coming in took down the information and then rushed into the studio to present it to the announcer as he was reading the news. On one uh, memorable occasion the gentleman taking the news down on this telephone forgot that he had the headphones on, rushed away, and uh, on that particular evening, it was a very short news bulletin indeed. One thing a lot of people swear by is the accuracy and reliability of the BBC Times signal. Was this always so? Well, perhaps to the nearest 30 seconds it may have been. Uh, in the very first days, there was quite a to-do about the Times signal. We used to announce for a long time beforehand that uh, listeners should stand by in order to get the accurate time signal from Paris, direct from Paris. I've no idea why, but uh, in a room, I should think about 100 yards away from the studio, was uh, the, the most complicated piece of apparatus known to man at that time, a six-valve set, which remained tuned direct to Paris. 
The announcer, after warning everybody to stand by, went through about half a dozen swing doors and up and down steps and so on to this room, uh, put on the headphones, and as soon as he heard the first pip of the six pips coming from Paris, threw off the phones, rushed back through all the doors, and by the time he got to the microphone, hit a gong as hard as he could, which might, of course, been somewhere near six o'clock. And this is where Victor Smythe comes bursting in again. He was the drama king in those days, and didn't he just set about it? He started the 2ZY Repertory Company. You must remember there were, I think I'm right in saying, 823 repertory companies, or amateur repertory companies, I should say, amateur companies, live amateur companies throughout Yorkshire and Lancashire. Um, and I started to go round and meet people and see their shows, and uh, eventually I got together the first repertory company in Great Britain, the 2ZY Repertory Company, and I had 28 uh, uh, men and women of the nicest people I ever wished to meet, and that's how we, uh, we really got down to playing parts. Otherwise, I played five parts in the first place. Uh, I had to go out and address uh, various local groups, radio listening groups, uh, which was organised by the uh, radio retailers. And uh, it was there I came across the criticism that a man who shut his shop at eight and got home at half past eight found it very difficult to know what was going on. So I developed a simple brochure in which I summarised in, in almost childish language what had taken place from the time the curtain went up until the, the curtain came down in each scene. Then I went out with my bag and sold space to uh, the um, radio retail shops in Manchester until I had paid for the uh, cost of the brochure. And um, I may say that we made a profit, which was a shocking thing then, because we weren't supposed to have anything to do with money, as you probably know. Well, there you have the actors. What about the plays? Who wrote those? At a rough guess, I would say L. Dugard Peach. I never stopped hearing his name on the radio when I was a lad, and he's still writing plays. Randall Hurley went to see him. Does your memory go back to the time you wrote your first radio play? Yes, I think that was in the following year, 1924. And uh, in those days, nobody had written any radio plays because, after all, a play is something that you've got to see. Uh, so when uh, I was asked to write one, I thought the only thing to do is to write a play, the scene of which takes place in the dark. And uh, I wrote one about some people coming home to a flat. It was called Light and Shade. Uh, the electric light had failed, and they tumbled over things and so on. It was a very short comedy. After that, I wrote another one in which people were down in the bottom of a coal mine where it was dark. Then somebody wrote one about people battened down in a hold of a ship. Then, of course, the dark places ran out, and we had to think again. So we thought of making the atmosphere by sounds. And uh, as background sounds, some of those that were used were extraordinary. We did a broadcast of the ship by St. John Irvin, and we uh, tried all sorts of things to make the sound of this great liner hitting the iceberg, like the Titanic in 1912. And uh, we nearly wrecked the studio, breaking up boxes, smashing furniture, and finally, we found the only way to do it, and the most effective way, was to crumple a wooden matchbox in the hand very close to the mic, and it sounded terrific. I don't know why, but it seems inevitable that we go back over the Pennines to Albert Aldred for some earthy recollections of early spot effects. Now we've got uh, quite a repertoire of uh, effects records, but in the old days we, we never had that... Uh, facility, and we used to have to make all our own spot effects. With uh, one of them, I do remember, it always sticks in my mind, of, uh, it was a play, Black Diamonds, and the heroine, the hero rather, was pushed in to the cauldron of molten steel by the villain. And of course, the producer in those days wanted a lovely sizzle and you could quite imagine all the public uh, what they felt like when this chappie was pushed in. But we got the sizzle all right with a vinegar bottle and a flat iron, and we had a beautiful sizzle. And, and that was the end of the programme. <laughs> Not surprised it wasn't the end of might have been the end of broadcasting <laughs> if they had such as tender consciences as they have now, I should say. That's the <laughs> ghastly sound. <laughs> <laughs> and don't ever let Albert Aldred get at the telly. Those weren't spot effects, they were blisters. And blisters certainly seem to have got at the paintwork in Manchester during an epic Victor Smythe production, still glowing in the mind of Jack Hollinshead. Well, I think Red Knight was one of the most exciting 
plays we did, um, Victor Smythe had the attic uh, fitted out as trenches with drawings of uh, old Bill and microphones installed up there to create atmosphere. And all the shells and grenades uh, were electrically detonated fireworks which we had hanging from the uh, banister rail over the uh, staircase down from the studio. These were detonated by pressing bell pushes in the effects room so we had them marked on the bell push board which were shells and which were bombs you see and the same on the uh, terminal board on the, um, uh, on the firework um, uh, board and the poor cast were afraid of negotiating the staircase during the play and they had to pop along to the effects room to see whether um, things were clear in the <laughs> explosives department <laughs> uh, and at certain times we had to dash along there and um, uh, replenish um, whenever there was a lull in the fighting put, put on new um, bombs and shells oh they were quite terrific the um, um, the staircase had to be repaired afterwards uh, several pieces of plaster <laughs> fell off the walls during that production <laughs> I don't know about the Red Knight the White Queen could have been in on that one are they still at it? could be you know on checking up I found that by the 30s the BBC was really set fair and very efficient and really incredible things weren't happening so often so that almost finishes my tale, except for one strange fact that's emerged. Marlene, Beryl Reed, isn't a Brummy at all. She's a Mancunian, late of Withington. She started broadcasting in Manchester in the 30s as a child. It was, I think, 1936 I, uh, I did my first broadcast here, and I was the, uh, it was for David Porter, who was a producer here in those days, and uh, I was the uh, the 29th audition on a Sunday night. And I, I did my broadcast in a rather nice low sort of voice that I thought would sound a bit of all right. And I did my, I gave them my Gracie Fields and all that because I did impressions, you see, in those days. And um, I finished off quite nicely. And then all my caution went to the wind and I said, do you think I'll get a job? <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> David Porter sort of reeled back at this terrible, hysterical voice that came and said, yes, I think you well might get a job, and I did. I was so thrilled to be actually broadcasting, and um, at the same time, I, uh, I was just about to leave school. I actually started broadcasting before I left school, and I was at school with Pat Kirkwood for the last two years here. And we used to come home on our bicycles together and say, I've got another broadcast. Oh, you are awful. I haven't. How rotten. All that used to go on. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and then one terrible day, Pat said, I'm going on the stage. And I said, oh, you lucky thing. <laughs> because by that time, I wasn't actually allowed to go on the stage. That came just a little while later. Well, there it is then. But that's only the start, of course. Life begins at 40. We have new spirits, just as gay, so watch it. But as we're looking back, though, tonight, let's end on memories of 2ZY and 6KH and 5NO and 2LS and 6 -O. Oh, very joyous. Um, I think, particularly in the days of the broadcasting company, we were a band of pioneers. We were finding our way. There were no rules. I wouldn't say there, are no, there were no administrative rules, but there were originally no rules on how broadcasting could be done or should be done. Nobody knew. I think many people thought we were drunk, but nobody on that station was ever drunk. But we were just young and hilarious and thoroughly enjoying something new and exciting. They were live, yes, sir. We didn't believe in recordings. Well, I was a schoolboy at the time, and I think I was about 10 or 11 years old. Kenneth Wright, the station director, was Uncle Humpty Dumpty. Uh, another of our friends was the Sandman, who used to sing the children to sleep. And I rejoiced in the name of Dinko, the foreman of the Pixies. And with that... I'll wave my magic wand and vanish!